So I'm, I'm, on behalf of, the, of UCLA's Institute for Latin American Studies and uh, several, uh, and our deans of humanities and social sciences and several other uh, um, de de groups and departments at the university, I I'm delighted to welcome you to UCLA and to this in inaugural event uh, co-sponsored by UCLA and by the French Institute of the Americas. You know, a network of over 30 French universities where significant teaching and research takes place uh, focusing on the Americas. That is to say, uh, on the Americas as a, a hemispheric study, so to speak, giving pride of place to the social sciences and the humanities. The Institute is designed to promote research and cooperation in all relevant areas, including, of course, very specialized areas. But its special charge uh, is to determine the value added that can be generated when colleagues from different disciplines and who specialize in different cultural or linguistic areas can come together in meaningful context of dialogues and interactions. Part of the mission of the Institute is to develop relationships of cooperation uh, with key universities in Latin America, the United States, and Canada uh, in what are called poles or hubs of cooperation. And the agreement that we're going to be signing uh, this afternoon, I mean, around 5 o'clock, as well as this symposium, marks the beginning of our collaboration, UCLA's collaboration, with the Institute of the Americas. Uh, I happen to be, uh, I was representing the University of California system in France uh, for a period of three years in my capacity as a director of the University of California Study Center in Paris, uh, where we welcomed 300 UC students every year. And at the time, the Institute of the Americas was being created. At the time, I was also um, a visiting professor at the <coughs> Institute of Political Science in Paris, where I was teaching courses on inter-American literature, which is the comparative study of North and South American literatures. In that general context, I had the privilege of meeting Professor Jacques Potier, you know, who is, of course, internationally known as a great scholar of North American literature, but he is also fluent in Spanish, interested in Latin American literature, and in, the, and in hemispheric studies in a more global way. In that context, I was invited to participate as a, as a, a foreign member of the Institute of the Americas Steering Committee, and it was a fascinating and privilege to be able to participate in those uh, conversations. And over the years, we've had some very nice visits from several French scholars um, who participate in the Institute of the Americas for informal events or formal talks, you know, including Professor Olivier Daben, who was here last year from the Institute of Political Science. Of course, there are other uh, collaborations going on. So I'd, I'd like to invite, Professor Paty will speak later on at five o'clock, but I would like to invite him to say a couple of words you know, about the mission of the Institute of the Americas before I, I say more about uh, the events of the day. Thank you very much, Efrain. And uh, I can never express our thanks enough for the uh, development of this collaboration uh, between UCLA and uh, the Institute of the Americas. So I, as you say, I'm just going to say a couple of words about what the IDA does and uh, I will maybe uh, develop just a little more in a moment when we, in the second phase of this uh, meeting. Um, so um, as Efrain was saying, with less than 10 years in operation, our cluster of research institutions has uh, grown into the main French network of studies and research on the Americas. The Institute of the Americas is a consortium of 61 universities and institutions of higher education, which include the CNRS, which is the main body of research for France, or the EHESS, 
It supports research by a system of grants to support the mobility of students, graduate students, to support conferences. It publishes two series of books on the Americas. Uh, it has started a peer-reviewed online journal, Ideas or Ideas, whether you want to pronounce it in Spanish or in English, uh, or Ideas, if you want to pronounce it in French. Uh, but the, the Institute of the Americas is not content with supporting existing research. Its mission has always been to project other activities and other approaches, as Efrain uh, also outlined. I don't know why I'm, I'm speaking, because he said it very well. Uh, and that is one reason why we are setting up these uh, 12 overseas hubs or poles of cooperation. Uh, such as this one, uh, which um, will, of course, have as a mission to disseminate the French approach on the American region, but also, more importantly, I think, be the international crucible or contribute or ambition to be the crucible where different uh, uh, perspectives, uh, different gazes on the Americas can meet in the social sciences and the humanities. Thank you. Great. Thanks, thanks very much. Uh, the, the, the idea then of this, of this symposium is to signal areas of uh, possible cooperation between the Institut des Amériques and UCLA by bringing together French and UCLA scholars who represent uh, these areas where we think some fruitful collaboration can take place. Uh, the idea for the symposium uh, was that of Amandine de Bruyker, who is the representative of the Institute of the Americas in California. And I'd like to say uh, a few words uh, about her, a few words about uh, the conception of the activity, and then invite her to come up and, and introduce the first panel. So, Amandine de Bruyker, uh, you know, she is uh, a PhD candidate in social anthropology at the Ex-Marseille University in France, and she is also a member of the Institut d'Ethnologie Méditerranée Européenne et Comparative, called the IDEMEC. She currently conducts her research on the cycles of life and death among Zapotec communities in Los Angeles, and her fields of research cover the Oxcocaean migrations, the study of community and family celebrations, the indigenous traditions of care, and the reshaping of identity. So it was natural, you know, in speaking with, with Amandine to, uh, to, to want to feature an, an area in which both UCLA and French scholars have already done uh, major contributions to knowledge, that is to say uh, US-Mexico migration studies, but where, of course, there's a lot more work uh, to be done. And this will be the, uh, the, the faculty panel featured in the afternoon. But we also thought that it would be splendid to feature the work of graduate students in areas where we can also clearly cooperate, you know, and of course, representing different areas. We are very lucky that Antoine Guégan, uh, a graduate student from the University of Paris, is visiting Los Angeles, where he's doing research at the Margaret Herrick Library and at UCLA on issues that involve slavery and American film. And we also thought that it would be splendid to feature uh, some very innovative work by two UCLA graduate students uh, in the round table as well, moderated by Amandine, so we would have uh, an, an, a, a, a small symbolic event where two UCLA graduate students and two French graduate students are collaborating together in uh, an, initial, an initial event of this kind. So please, let, let me uh, uh, then conclude my uh, remarks and welcome uh, Amandine to uh, moderate the first round table. Thank you very much, Professor Crystal. I'm very pleased to present today's first panel. This graduate student roundtable is very important for us in uh, 
Institute des Amériques because, as you will see, the diversity of the topics brought here a good example of the diversity that the Institute des Amériques encourages. Indeed, whether we are referring to research in comparative literature, history, or film studies, the interdisciplinary perspectives of today's presentations are an important part in the perpetual development of research in humanities and social sciences. Thus, the uh, dialogue proposed between students or researchers of America and France aims to strengthen collaboration and to advance knowledge. But um, without further delay, I would like to introduce you to Antoine Guégan, who is PhD candidate at the Center of Literature, Knowledge and Art, LISA, see? Mm -hmm. <laughs> of the University of Paris Est, Marne La Vallée, where he is speciali speci oh, sorry. specialized in film studies. In his research, he focused on representation of slavery in Hollywood cinema. His today's presentation is titled From Uncle Tom's Cabin to 12 Years a Slave, Representation of Slavery in American Cinema. Thank you, Amandine. First, I would like to thank Ms. Professor Efren Crystal, who gave me the opportunity to speak today, and the Department of Comparative Literature and Latin American Institute, who have organized the whole event. event. I hope you will excuse my English, which is still quite rusty. And please do not hesitate to tell me if you have any difficulty to fully understand my speech. My topic today will be the presentation of my thesis that I have begun this year. My subject, like Amandine said, is a slavery representation in American cinema between 1903, which was the first adaptation of Uncle Tom's Cabin by Edwin S. Porter, to 2013, the year of 12 years a slave. As strange as it may seem, there is not even one study about the representation of slavery in the American cinema. Of course, there is plenty of books evoking the role of African Americans in cinema and how they have involved in it, but slavery movies always represent one small aspect. Some historians also have tried to understand how slavery can be remembering, and when movie industry is discussed, it's always about the same film. Gone with the Wind, Birth of Nation, the TV series Woods, and more recently, Madingo. But this can be enough. That's why a full study of slavery representation in the American cinema is necessary. Therefore, during my PhD years, I want to study how the motion picture industry has pictured slavery on the big screen and what it reveals about the American society. In my opinion, it is the only way to understand how slavery history has been reinvented by the American cinema according to events of its time, and to discern why Hollywood has been so reluctant to produce some powerful movies against this famous, infamous institution. In the same way, I also want to identify why, when some independent movies showed another aspect of slavery, the white spectators were not interested by them. At this purpose, my filmography will be composed of approximately 50 movies. A good part of them are silent, and since time has taken its toll, the majority is considered to be lost. Fortunately, magazines, newspapers will be a huge help in this case. TV movies and even TV series will be also some filmography significant determinants because it could be negative of a differential treatment between the two media. I will also include European films on American servitude. Even if they were often criticized by the American film critics, they show a different point of view on some similar subject developing in Hollywood movies. Moreover, there is no so many movies dealing directly with slavery. To give you some example, the Birth of Nation, So Red the Woes, Gone with the Wind, can be categorized as plantation movies. There is also some Western, some black exploitation movies, where in fact, slavery is just an aspect. For the rest, in a wood way, we can observe three big periods. The first one from 1903 to 1960, 
which is a classical slavery period where the old South myth is still strong. The second one from 1968 to 1984 where some independent production exposed a new aspect of the particular institution. And finally, the third one from 90, uh, 1991 to the more recent 12 Years of Slave, which is a black busters era. A turning point of my thesis is explanation of the white audience's lack of interest. When, for example, Herbert Biberman with Slave in 1969 and Richard Fleischer with Mandingo in 1975, two independent movies proposed the darker version of slavery with scene of miscegenation and physical abuses. The first reason is more than evident. Because segregation was still going on, um, the first movie generation accustomed white spectators with a racist vision of slavery, where the old South was depicted as a paradise on earth, where slaves were happy to work for their masters. Karen Rose in black and white media, black image in popular film and television, remind us how, after the Civil War, the South took its revenge through novels, theater, and cinema. In a few years, even the Uncle Tom's image was transformed into a piece of Southern propaganda. Thanks to some successful Tom shows, a kind of minstrel shows, the image of the devoted Tom ready to betray his fellows had surpassed the original character invented by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Because these movies were some huge successes, the ID provided were easily understandable. That is why when Slave and Mandingo came out, the audience wasn't prepared. The image shot by Beverman and Fleischer were so new in the team exported that it was hard for white people to believe what they just saw on the big screen because they had nothing to compare with. This is a link with the second reason. The white audience surprise and poor attitude are evidence of a lack of knowledge. I believe that if slavery movies are even now still reluctant to show a stronger critique of the particular institution, it is because this dark period of US history is not well known to the general public, and not that much a question of racism. It is acknowledged that history teaching in, a, in the American public school system is more than deficient. For example, in an article published in the 90s, the historian James Oliver Norton has demonstrated that, for example, in Louisiana, West Virginia, Oklahoma, Pennsylvania, and Kansas, for the worst case, up to 80% of history teachers never studied history in college. Their first job is to be the basketball football coach. Based on these facts, we can easily imagine the little history that most of the American people will remember. Other studies by Peter Colchin or Lee H. Washburn um, have pro proved that history textbooks were full of mistakes and dangerous shortcuts. Even more, according to the historian Ira Berlin, in coming to terms with slavery in 21st America, American people have a very low knowledge on slavery, and for them, sl slavery rhymes with cotton, deep south, and civil war. Only a few know that slavery is a multi-century institution. We can only imagine how the situation has been worse in the past, in the 60s or 50s. Now we understand why white people don't feel concerned by this kind of movies. They still have this image of the good master, kind to his slave. And they do not want to feel sorry for something they don't know about and which they can connect. Still, due to the African-American audience, Madingo and slaves, and the other kind of films were still very lucrative. But Fleischer and Bitberman were quite disappointed. It was not enough for them. While working on the, on the origin of their movies, I have found that they wanted to finish for once and for all with this whole South's positive depiction. One day, Bitberman and Fleischer discovered the horror slavery had been, 
and they understood how urgent it was to make a movie which would show a new aspect of servitude far away from the plantation genre. In a matter of fact, their movies echoed the slavery historiography renewal with books like Roll Jordan Roll by Eugene Ginovese or Time on the Cross by Robert Fogel and Stanley and German. Despite all the best intentions, critics were harsh and the movies did not stimulate the expected debates. In my opinion, these movies were undervalued, yet they constitute one of the strongest slavery critics ever seen on the screen. These movies share another common point, which is a complete absence of a, of a good white character. I believe this absence is the first reason of the massive white audience absence in the, in the dark room. That's why the last period that I called the blockbuster one has proposed film with a white character in the leading role like in Glory, Amistad, or Django Unchained, or at least a good white part like in 12 Years a Slave. In order to make best use of these ideas, my approach will be a historic one. More precisely, I will use a method similar to the cultural studies and transdisciplinary studies. I will look movies in external way. What I mean is that I will not analyze my, um, my filmography in an aesthetic way. In fact, the only aesthetic aspect will be to produce a typology of the genre. I will choose some of the most representative scenes of the slave daily life, work on the plantation, relation with the master with the other slaves, the family, the presentation of the slave culture or its absence, and the representation of the resistance. Thanks to this analysis, I hope to be able to look at slavery representation in a new look. And to say if it has been continually improved until now, or if it has advanced in fits and starts. But my analysis will be mainly focused on the primary sources surrounding it. I will use production notes successive scenarios, censorship archives, correspondence between producers, writers, and filmmakers to try to understand how a slavery movie is conceived and what can be seen or not on the screen. I will also focus on black and white critics to understand how a movie was and is understood. If white and black journalists make the same remarks, a comparison will be produced with the box office grosses to see if negative critics or good critics has an impact on the spectators. I'm sorry to say that since I just started to work on this um, archives, I can't say much about it, but if you ask me some questions at the end, I will try to, to answer. Also, we often compare literature and cinema. Since a good part of slavery movies were at the beginning, some bestsellers. If I have enough time, I will try to see what has been cut in the book when we see the movie. Comparative history could be also a useful tool. South American and Caribbean cinema also made slavery movies. Knowing this fact, a quick study on the differences with American cinema will show the oppositions between countries. To conclude, I will say that I hope this approach will be the most suitable to exploit all the different aspects of my subject. Thank you very much, Antoine, for this very interesting presentation. In continuation, I'm delighted to introduce you to Jenny Marie Fawcett. She received her master's degree in Latin American literature from the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México in 2011. She is a third year PhD student of comparative literature at UCLA and part part of UCLA's graduate certificate program in early modern and 18th century studies. She has also worked as an interim for the Louisiana State Museum's project to digitize and translate 18th century 
judicial records from French and Spanish New Orleans. Her presentation is titled Contested Space in Translation, Vision, and Revisions of Florida in Early Modern Europe. Thank you. Hello. Oh. Thank you for your introduction, Amandine, and thank you everyone for being here and for giving me the chance to share what I do with you. I study cultures of translation in early modern France. I look first at texts, the series of words written by authors and rewritten by translators, and then at the objects that wrap around the text, books created through the collective efforts of editors, illustrators, engravers, and other scholars and artisans as the texts are printed and reprinted. My current project focuses on 17th and 18th century French translations of Spanish histories about the Americas. Studying these works in translation lets us see how histories change as they move from one culture to another, how they are shaped by different audiences. Today, I want to talk to you about French translations of a Spanish history of Florida. From the early 16th to the early 19th centuries, Florida, or La Florida, or La Floride, was the European name for a vast expanse of land in the southeastern part of North America, inhabited by the Guale, the Timucua, the Apalachee, and other native people. For centuries, the Spanish, French, and later English all competed to colonize and control parts of Florida. Theodore de Bry printed this early map of Florida in 1591 in Frankfurt in the wake of a little known episode in the history of Franco-Spanish conflict in the Americas. If you look closely at the top two corners, you'll see the map includes two coats of arms. The one on the left is the Spanish coat of arms of Philip II, and the other is the French coat of arms used by Charles IX. During the reign of both these monarchs, Spanish and French soldiers fought each other on the Atlantic coast of Florida at Fort Caroline. French Protestants founded Charles Fort and Fort Caroline in 1562 and 1564. The settlements were meant to challenge Spanish claims to sovereignty in the Americas, to open up new trade routes, and some historians argue, to pave the way for future communities of French Protestants seeking religious freedom in the New World. But in September of 1565, Spanish soldiers landed at Fort Caroline and killed some 600 French settlers there. Now, contemporary historians remember this conflict in different ways. Raquel Chang Rodriguez writes that the Spanish troops expelled the French settlers. But Frank Lestringant calls this event not an expulsion, but a massacre. After they killed the French, the Spanish built Fort Ma San Mateo on top of the destroyed Fort Caroline, and three years after that, French troops arrived in a retaliatory mission and massacred the Spanish at Fort San Mateo. Lestringant calls this series of events a St. Bartholomew's Day massacre in the New World. I'm going to show you how the massacres at Fort Caroline and Fort San Mateo appear in French translations of the Spanish history of Florida in texts and in other forms of print media. La Florida del Inca gives a remarkable Spanish language account of Hernando de Soto's 16th century expedition across Florida. The author, Inca Garcilaso de la Vega, grew up speaking Quechua and Spanish and reading Latin in Cusco, Peru. He moved to Spain in 1560, where he became the first American historian of the Americas. Garcilaso never set foot on the land his history describes. He wrote La Florida del Inca based on a variety of oral and written sources, and he crafted incredibly rich, complex stories about the conflicts and alliances between European soldiers and the native people they encountered. Garcilaso's Florida was published three times in Spanish in the 17th and 18th centuries. It was translated into French as Histoire de la Floride in 1670 by Pierre Richelet. Richelet is best known today as the lexicographer who wrote the first ever monolingual French dictionary. But his translation of Garcilaso's history was more successful than the original. It was printed and reprinted seven times in the 17th and 18th centuries. The spike in 18th century reprintings of Richelet's translation coincides with the War of the Spanish Succession, with Louis XIV's increased efforts to establish French settlements in Louisiana, 
and with the contributions French Protestant exiles made to the printing industry in the Dutch Republic after they were expelled from France by the revocation of the Edict of Nantes. The conflicts between Catholics and Protestants that divide Europe at the start of the 18th century are reflected back in Garcilaso's history and in Richelieu's translation, along with Franco-Spanish imperial rivalries. Between 1500 and 1700, France and Spain fought against each other in some 15 wars. When Garcilaso wrote La Florida del Inca, at the end of the 16th century, he was motivated in part by the fear that Spain and the Catholic faith would lose Florida to France. Near the end of his history, he refers indirectly to the massacres at Fort Caroline and Fort San Mateo when he pleads that the Spanish crown not allow neighboring nations corrupted by heresy to spread their religion in Florida as they have already attempted. Whether Protestant evangelization was part of the plan for settlers at Fort Caroline is a contentious issue for contemporary historians. Religious and imperial conflicts were also a contentious issue for the translator. Richelieu's strategy involves omitting large sections of Garcilaso's text, as you can see in this side-by-side -side transcription of excerpts from the first chapter of each version. Not only did Richelieu cut out the pro-Spanish, pro-Catholic quote from Garcilaso that I just showed you, but he also threw out the entire chapter that contained it. In general, Richelieu seems interested in erasing efforts, references to Spain, God, and divine providence to creating a sanitized or de-Hispanicized version of Garcilaso's history. Richelieu's translation is reprinted in 1709 with two changes that will stay with the book in subsequent editions. First of all, the word conquet, conquest, is added to the first part of the title. This book, which I photographed at the Bibliothèque Nationale de France in Paris, is no longer advertised as a story about Florida, but as a story dealing specifically with the conquest of Florida. And there is a new foreword that explains why a story about the conquest of Florida is still worth reading in 1709. For one thing, the foreword says, Garcilaso's history is good because it shows how very unsuccessful De Soto's Spanish expedition was. And the foreword goes on to resurrect the story of Fort Caroline to support an imperial claim, the claim that Florida was also discovered by the French in the same century as De Soto's expedition during the reign of Charles IX. After this edition, editors continue to draw new connections between Garcilaso's history and the events at Fort Caroline, between Spanish and French imperial history. This 1737 edition of the History of the Conquest of Florida was published by the French Protestant exile jean frederic Bernard in Amsterdam. I photographed this book at the Getty Research Institute Special Collections in Los Angeles. In Bernard's edition, Richelieu's translation is sandwiched between a French map of Louisiana and the path of the Mississippi River and the story of French missionary Louis Hennepin's travels around the Great Lakes of New France. And it also includes several engraved illustrations. By placing the history of Florida between a French map and a French travel narrative, Bernard is recontextualizing Garcilaso's history to make it part of a French imperial archive. In a way, it's like he's conquering Garcilaso's text. This is a clear image of the map Bernard reproduces in his edition of Florida. The cartographer who mapped out part of France's empire in 1718 actually used textual data from Garcilaso's history to fill in details about place names and topography. So the cartographer uses Garcilaso's history to create the map, and the editor, Bernard, then uses the map to recreate Garcilaso's history. Among the many extraordinary details in the map of Louisiana, we find a record of the site where Fort Caroline once stood, the site where the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre in the New World took place. The other images in Bernard's edition are also connected to the site. They're inspired by a series of lost sketches by the Protestant artist Jacques Lemoyne, who lived through the Franco-Spanish conflict at Fort Caroline. The artist, Lemoyne, arrived at the French fort in 1564, tasked with recording and mapping as much as he could. And Lemoyne was one of some 30 survivors of the Spanish massacre. He and his sketches somehow made it back to Europe, and the sketches eventually fell into the hands of Protestant engraver and publisher Theodore de Bry, who turned them into a series of 42 engravings and published them in the second part of his great voyages in 1591, along with the map of Florida that I showed you at the beginning. 
And the UCLA Library Special Collections has nine volumes of The Great Voyages. That's where I photographed them. Um, so since Lemoyne's sketches are lost, Debray's engravings after them, like this one that shows a group of men in a circle lifting their arms toward a deer on a pole and the sun, are probably the closest we can get to imagining what the artists saw of the lives of the Timucua and the French settlers at Fort Caroline in the months leading up to the massacre. Debray's engravings are the inspiration behind the images Bernard uses to illustrate the 1737 edition of the History of the Conquest of Florida. This is the next image readers see in Bernard's edition after the map of Louisiana. So here we have Debray's engraving of the circle of men around a deer in 1591. And then we have it in Bernard's edition, a circle of men around a deer facing in the other direction in 1737. Um, the caption tells us that the image depicts an offering that the Floridians make of a stag to the sun. But on the next page, the text explains that the people of Florida are idolaters and they have the sun and the moon for their deities without offering them prayers or sacrifices. Right below this text, next to a little cross, there's a footnote that calls the reader's attention to the fact that the image and the text don't match. The footnote says, nevertheless, one sees here the offering they make of a stag to the sun. Bernard, the editor, the creator of the book, is modifying Richelieu's translation, the text, in two ways here. First, he adds an image to this history that comes to him from Florida through a series of Protestant artists. And secondly, he comments on the contradiction that results from this modification. The footnote asks the reader to become an eyewitness to the history of Florida by emphasizing the sense of sight one sees here, and by describing the actions of seeing and of making a sacrifice in a simultaneous present tense. One sees here the offering they make. What we are seeing here is the collision of two different genealogies of knowledge that we can trace back to the 16th century Franco-Spanish Imperial, Franco Imperial conquest uh, contest over Florida. Okay, so on the one hand, we have a scene witnessed by the Protestant Lemoyne recorded in a lost sketch that travels from the Atlantic coast of North America to Europe, where it is reproduced by other Protestant artists and engravers over two centuries. And on the other hand, we have the orally transmitted memories of one of DeSoto's Spanish soldiers, which Garcilaso commits to writing according to his own agenda, and which is rewritten by Richelieu and further modified by Bernard. The point that I'm trying to make here is not one about who has the most reliable information, because we've seen how information presented as facts can actually be very unreliable but that studying translations can make multiple and sometimes contradictory histories simultaneously visible. And it can show us the hidden histories of the places we might otherwise take for granted. Thank you very much, uh, Jenny. Your work is really fascinating. And finally, to conclude this one table, I would like to introduce uh, Fernando Serrano. Fernando Serrano is a PhD candidate at the University of California, Los Angeles, in the Department of History, where he is specialized in the Latin American field. In his research, he focused on the colonial history of Mexico, and in particular, on the present-day states of Michoacán and Guanajuato. Pardon, sorry. He is currently working on his doctoral dissertation, which uh, analyzes the impact of the silver mining industry in the Guanajuato mining center on the indigenous population in the region that were directly impacted by the industry. In today's presentation, he will analyze the nature of regional migrations to the Guanajuato mines throughout the colonial period and its significance in understanding the nature of ethnic identity in the mining center. Thank you. All right, so first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers of this event for uh, the invitation to share some of my research with you today. I applaud the goal of the Institut des Amériques to promote productive collaborations between scholars around the world specializing in the Americas. And I hope that my presentation today will be a positive contribution to that end. So my presentation will have two parts. On the first one, 
I will brief, very briefly describe my orbital research. On the second, I will focus on a particular topic which is central to my research, the debate over the presence of indigenous men and women in the Guanajuato mines during the colonial period. So the, the region I consider in my research includes areas of the present day states of Michoacán and Guanajuato in Mexico, as you can see on the map. The, and there are three main administrative districts known as Alcaldías Mayores that I consider in my research. The Alcaldía Mayor of, um, of Guanajuato, the Alcaldía Mayor of Celaya, both of them in the present day state of Guanajuato, and then the Alcaldía Mayor of Valladolid sometimes simply known as the province of Michoacán, as you can see here um, in, in this map. And in fact, um, the, the province of Michoacán did not include uh, a, a big parts of the state of the current, uh, the current state of Michoacán, as you can see here. It included all the alcaldías mayores. The one that I'm really focusing on is this one, uh, the Alcaldía Mayor of Valladolid. While Guanajuato is well known for its mining industry during the colonial period, Michoacán was an important population center inhabited, inhabited by the Tarascans, among other groups, who played a significant role in the region both before and after the Spanish conquest. In my research, I study the participation of indigenous workers from Michoacán in Guanajuato's colonial mining industry and the impact that this had on them and their communities of origin. I do so first by considering the labor, labor institutions utilized to recruit workers for the mines, as these provide important clues as to the nature of the labor force and its demographic characteristics. Then I analyze the short and long-term migrations of indigenous workers to the region and the adaptations that they made in order to adjust to, the, to life and work in this mining center. Finally, I study the ways in which the indigenous communities were affected by these migrations and the, way, and the ways in which they reacted. Although my research deals with uh, the silver mining industry and can be confused with the work of economic history, I consider my research as ethno-historical in nature since my main interest is to establish an indigenous presence in Guanajuato during the colonial period. In part, this is due to the fact that an indigenous presence in this mining town has been generally minimized. The city of Guanajuato is currently classified as a World Heritage Site because of its colonial legacy, which the city emphasizes by, re by recreating Spanish medieval traditions that are meant to give tourists a taste of what colonial period life was supposed to be like. For example, the now traditional callejonadas, uh, street tours, with the Estudiantinas, student music groups dressed in European Renaissance period garments, attempt to reproduce the Spanish medieval tradition of Tunas and are supposed to give the city a sense of, of authenticity. This is mainly targeted to a national audience which has learned to associate colonial with European and thus what they expect of a quote unquote colonial city such as Guanajuato is to have a significant European influence. Also, it, can, it, can, it can't be denied that Europeans had a significant presence in this city. That is only a part of the story. The other side of the story is the overwhelming presence of indigenous men and women who made the city and the region around the city their homes. What I will consider in this presentation then is the way in which this overwhelming indigenous presence has been minimized or even at times ignored. Scholars studying the history of Guanajuato have generally tended to emphasize its uh, mestizo essence. It is claimed by many that Guanajuato is the quintessential mestizo state in the country, given its mixture of Europeans and indigenous people that occurred during the colonial period due to the mining industry. For example, Eric Wolf considered the Bajio region from Western Guanajuato to Central Querétaro as a distinctive social and cultural complex, which he argued produced a new economy and a new type of men, that is, mestizos. Given its more, quote unquote, open economy that was unhampered by indigenous communities as the central areas of Mexico were. He claimed that the frontier offered indigenous people the opportunity to cut off connections to their communities. Thus, 
For Wolf, the main characteristic of the mine workers was an alienation from the village matrix. And this integration into in and their integration into the so-called quote new society of free and highly mobile wage workers. As for most scholars, Wolf considered a disconnection to the community as a disconnection to a, an indigenous identity. And thus the quote unquote new men will simply become the well-known Mexican mestizo. In a similar way, David Braden, in a very classic work on Guanajuato, analyzed the composition of the population in the reg region around Guanajuato based on the numbers presented above, obtained from a census taken in 1792. <coughs> Interestingly, interestingly, based on this, he concluded that in the Bajio, in the Bajio's population, persons of mixed blood predominated. And it's interesting to see that, based on his own numbers, uh, Indians composed 44% of the population, Spaniards 26, castes, include, which included those that classified themselves as mestizos, 12%, and mulatos, 18%. So how did he come to the conclusion that people of mixed blood uh, predominated. Well, he was able to reach this conclusion by asserting that it was safe to assume that the majority of Spaniards listed in this uh, possessed some mixture of Indian or African blood and thus could be classified as of mixed blood. Consequently, this made the people of quote unquote mixed blood 56% of the total population. He thus concluded that by the end of the 18th century, the Bajio had achieved what other provinces were to reach much later, the formation of a predominantly mestizo population. And, and that by this time, the Indians were already in a minority, a 44% minority, <laughs> but I guess a minority. So not only did he reclassify Spaniards as of mixed blood, but also went a step further and classified all these quote unquote mixed bloods groups are simply mestizos, supporting the claim that Guanajuato was, was basically, at that point, already a mestizo state. In a more recent study, Margarita Villalba Bustamante explored the nature of the population that lived in the vicinity of, the, of La Valenciana, the most productive silver mine in the world by the end of the colonial period. Villalba's findings are very interesting and informative. Looking at ecclesiastic censuses from 1805, she found the demographic information contained in, in that table. Focusing on the indigenous population, one can see that the neighborhood with the lowest percentage of indigenous people was the Plaza San Ramon in the town center, as one would expect. And the only one where indigenous people were not the biggest single group, and the, and the only one where the indigenous people were not the single biggest group. In two others, they constituted less than 50%, although they were still the biggest single group. While for the remainder five, they were a clear majority, in two cases surpassing 70% of the total population. So I think it's a little hard to see, but uh, the purple uh, um, um, bars are, uh, represent indigenous, the red represent um, the Spaniards, and then the other groups. So as you can see, there was a still a significant indigenous presence just by looking at this. My interpretation of this information is that it provides clear and convincing evidence of a still vibrant indigenous presence in the Guanajuato mines as late as 1805, since only in one particular instance, the Plaza San Ramon, did indigenous population fall to a 26% of the total, while in the rest they constituted the biggest single group and in most cases were the majority group. However, Villalba's main conclusion based on those same numbers was that this mining town was clearly on the road to mestizaje as the number of different racial groups living in such close proximity indicated, at least to, um, um, from her perspective. So even in cases like these where we have towns with an overwhelming majority of indigenous um, people, the interpretation of mestizaje is so strong, or the ideology of mestizaje is so strong that what they see is not the, the glass almost full, but the glass a little empty. <laughs> and for them, that, that represents mestizaje. <clears throat> Thus, scholars have strongly preferred an interpretation of the data 
that suggests mestizaje as the dominant trend during the colonial period, which will justify the conclusion that even before independence, Mexico was already on the road to becoming, if it was not already, a fully mestizo country. However, the erasure of an indigenous presence in Guanajuato has much deeper roots. This process began even as the colonial period was still in progress. An example of this is the case of Irapuato, just south of the city of Guanajuato and under its jurisdiction. Carlos Paredes Martinez documented an 18th century struggle between the city of Irapuato and the indigenous towns of San Jose, uh, inhabited by Otomis, and San Marcos uh, with the Tarascan population to maintain their status as Republicas de Indios, which they had held since the 17th century, only to learn the Spanish authorities in Irapuato not only denied their petition, but went so far as to deny that they had ever been Republicas de Indios in spite of the evidence provided by these two towns clearly show, showing otherwise. Paredes states that historians of Irapuato, present-day historians of Irapuato, based on documents produced by Spanish authorities, have continued to assert that indigenous towns never, uh, that in, 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 the indigenous towns never existed in colonial Irapuato, notwithstanding the overwhelming documentary evidence available in the city's archive that proved otherwise. In the previous examples, we have seen how an indigenous presence in Guanajuato has been consistently minimized or even denied many times by scholars who have interpreted the data available in a way that may not be fully justified. Some recent studies have addressed this situation. One such example is the case of Dana Velasco Murillo, whose recent dissertation work completed here at UCLA documented the persistence of indigenous culture in Zacatecas, a city which, just like Guanajuato, was reputed to be predominantly mestizo and or uh, Spanish. In her work, Velasco was able to show that by adopting Spanish institutions, such as the Cofradia, uh, a confraternity, and the Cabildo Municipal Council, indigenous migrants maintain important aspects of their culture, as well as a certain level of autonomy from the dominant Spanish groups in the city. She concluded that in spite of the changing circumstances around the city, indigenous ethnic identity maintain, was maintained throughout the colonial period by a significant number of indigenous people living inside and around the city. So to conclude, in a similar way, my goal with my research is to establish that indigenous presence in the Guanajuato Mining Center. In this case, this presence is primarily, although not exclusively, that of Tarascans from the province of Michoacan. This presence began, began early in, on in the foundation of the city when in the mid 16th century, the mines were first opened. Then the forced participation in the mines through the dreaded tandas or terms of service of the repartimiento labor draft started starting in the late 16th century and continuing on also in a much diminished level until the end of the 18th century. Finally, <coughs> finally through the voluntary migration both permanent and temporary to this mining town and the region around it. What this led to is what's what many have labeled mestizaje, but which was in fact a much more complicated process of acculturation on the one hand and ethnic reconfigurations on the other. Yes, there was a mixing of ethnic and racial groups and yes, there was a process of acculturation, but the concept of mestizaje rather than explaining the social reality of colonial Guanajuato obscures it. And this calls for a closer scrutiny of the term itself and of the long and complicated social and cultural processes that occurred throughout the colonial period in this region. Thank you. <laughs>